It's a good morning to be here today as we continue in the sermon series based on 2 Samuel and King David that, that Doug's been talking about the last few weeks. We're going to continue to talk about King David, and last week, Doug talked about in his message how King David committed not just one sin, not just two sin, but this wonderful series of sins, and how that affected his life and his relationship with the Lord. He talked about how temptation is always going to be there, but you know, through the good news of Jesus Christ, you know, we can be protected from that temptation. So when you think about sin and when you think about what you heard last week from, from what Pastor Doug was sharing, sin isn't usually something that's just easy to get out of. You commit one sin, it seems like a lot of the time, not all the time, you go to another sin and another and another and another. There's all this piling up and building up of sins. Now, does that happen all the time? Of course not, no. But what we watched and, 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 and kind of... Uh, dove into last week about King David, uh, that's exactly what happened to him. And so when we left the message last week, we had no closure on what's going on with David's life. Now, of course, I mean, if you've ever read 2 Samuel and you've read about the story of David's life, you know what's happening. And that's what we're going to talk about today in the confrontation between King David and the prophet Nathan. Now, to really get us rolling, let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, and we're going to start with verse 1. I'm going to read all the way up through verse 13, but there are a lot of other good verses that we can dive into, but I just want to narrow it down and focus on these first 13 verses. So if you do have your Bibles uh, with you today, would you please open those up and stand up with me as uh, we kind of go through and read the word of the Lord. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, He took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. King David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then the prophet Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, Your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I'll give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all of Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. You may be seated. I don't know why, but this is the second time I've had to prepare a message about confrontation and rebuking. It was just last June that I did a, uh, not, not this past June, like last June, like back in 2015, that I did a message on the hope found in rebuke. So it's kind of interesting that, that I'm getting tied back into to this message. Uh, the Lord works in mysterious ways, and he's probably trying to tell me something. <laughs> but in these verses, we see how the prophet Nathan confronts King David about his sins. So we're going to camp out here for a bit 
as we take a deeper look at, at, at the concept of confronting someone about their sins. But before we really get started, and I got to be honest, before I really got started in preparing, I went back and looked back at that original sermon. I mean, I have the notes. I was kind of looking through it and kind of chewing on some things. And one of the things that did pop out to me before we really get into what we're seeing here with Nathan and David is a point that is at the top of your bulletin. Christian believers should only confront other believers about their sin. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, we read, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into that same temptation yourself. So, I know I'm already jumping to the New Testament right now, but I feel like before we really get going and start talking about confronting someone about their sins, sins, we have to figure this point out and lay it out clearly. Paul is urging us in his letter to the Galatians to, yes, come alongside someone and help correct them and help them go down the correct path and away from their sin. But this type of process doesn't really work well for non-believers, For those of us who have that personal relationship with Jesus, for those of us who love the Lord with all our heart, with all our might, with all our soul, and with all our strength, coming up to someone who doesn't have that same type of relationship and telling them that they're sinning, it's just not going to fly. They don't believe the same things that you do. They, They don't have the same thought process about the Lord that you do. So you got to be really careful about who you do this with. And so it's an important point to make. Now, as we do continue through the rest of this message, I have come up with five points. And things that I've learned from Pastor Doug over the years is that most sermons have three. So, of course, I'm taking it to five, trying to make it confusing. But with with five points today, the first three points are all about individuals who are doing the confronting. But then the last two points are for those who are getting confronted. So hopefully you can be able to kind of help separate the, those, those points today as we're doing this, but I think that everything that we're going to be talking about today, everything that we're going to be delving into is going to be very important and beneficial. So to get us rolling, it's me. I'm back up here. It's been a minute. So to get us rolling, I, of course, have a movie clip. And for some of you, you're really going to enjoy this because I'm taking you back to that beautiful decade known as the 80s. There might be a few of you still there, I know. (laughs) See, the 80s were wonderful, right? You know, I mean, the movies were wonderful, the music was catchy. I mean, the outfits were just amazing. (laughs) All you got to do is go back to one of those uh, variety shows. I think it was last year with some of the ladies up here and what they were doing. But today, we are going to be watching a clip from a movie known as The Karate Kid. And I'm not talking the one with, you know, Jackie Chan. You know, we're talking about the real Mr. Miyagi. And to kind of help set up this clip, if any of you have ever seen this movie before, Daniel is running away from a Halloween party and he gets caught by five other teenagers who are just beating him up. Mr. Miyagi comes out of nowhere, and, you know, he kind of puts a little bit of a whooping on the teenagers, but he's not really trying to hurt them because, you know, he's an adult, these are teenagers, but, you know, he kind of just puts them down on the ground and stops Daniel getting beat up by five other guys. The next morning, Mr. Miyagi takes Daniel in his rusty old pickup truck and drives to the dojo where these five guys train to learn karate. And Mr. Miyagi wants to have a conversation with the dojo master about these boys. When they walk into the dojo, I mean, there's all types of karate practice stuff going on, and it's kind of ruthless. It's not the very peaceful type of karate that some of your kids may have been a part of, you know, where you're actually learning good things. I mean, this dojo master is a little bit straight off the path on the way that you're supposed to teach kids and and raise them up. So kids are beating each other up and no mercy and all this stuff, and of course, you know, one of the famous lines later in the movie, sweep the leg, right? And so we find Mr. Miyagi now with Daniel right behind him meeting this dojo master. So with that being said, let's roll it. Class, we have visitors. Fall in behind me. Hey!
I hear you jumped some of my students last night. Afraid the facts mixed up. You calling Mr. Lawrence a liar? No call no one, nothing. What are you here for, old man? Come ask, leave boy alone. What's the matter? The boy can't take care of his own problems? One to one problem, yes. Five to one problem. Too much ask anyone. Is that what's bothering you? The odds? Well, we can fix that. You like matching, Mr. Lawrence? Yes, Sensei! Uh, no more fighting. This is a karate dojo, not a knitting class. You don't come in my dojo and drop a challenge and leave, old man. Now, you get your boy on the matter, you and I will have a major problem. Too much advantage, your dojo. Name a place. Tournament. <laughs> You've got real nerve, old man. Real nerve. But I think we can accommodate you. Can't we, Mr. Lawrence? Yes, Sensei. Fall in. Confronting people about sins is definitely not easy. In this scene, did, were you kind of paying attention to some of the details, not just what was being said? Did you take a look at Daniel, who was, of course, standing behind Mr. Miyagi, trying to put that nice little barrier between him and all those other guys that were beating him up last night. He looks pretty nervous, doesn't he? What about Mr. Miyagi? He seemed pretty calm, pretty control of his emotions, pretty control of the situation, at least from his end of it. I will say, you know, if, if I'm Daniel, I'm probably feeling the same things that he is, you know. In that class, just a few moments before, we didn't get a chance to watch it all, but I mean, they were just beating each other up, and it was just practice. I mean, it was just training. And then, of course, you know, the dojo master says, everybody fall in. And, you know, they all do that arm thing and look all buff and tough, right? So Daniel's nervous. He's uh, a little bit scared, uh, not, not really feeling comfortable uh, where he's at. So I got a question for you. In a situation like that, or in any form of a confrontation, because as we read a little bit ago in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, Nathan confronts David. So in any type of scene of confrontation, what type of person are you generally going to be? Are you going to be Daniel-san or are you going to be Mr. Miyagi? So if we go back to verse 1, if we go back to verse 1 of Samuel, what we are led right off the bat to seeing is our first real point of today's message. It's talking about what leads us to confrontation. And what leads us to confrontation is the Lord. The Lord leads us to confrontation. Right away in verse 1 it says, So the Lord sent Nathan. It wasn't Nathan got a burr in his, in his bum and decided to go and talk to David. It wasn't that, you know, after sleeping on it, you know, Nathan said, you know, I need to go have a talk with David. No, it was the Lord sending Nathan to go and talk to David. Now, as I read this, a lot of things are going on inside my head because what I'm trying to do is picture myself inside of Nathan's sandals. I'm trying to put myself in his position, you know, five, six thousand years ago. And... and, and it kind of comes across to me as what maybe Daniel might have been thinking, or Mr. Miyagi, in that dojo. Now, the dojo and King David's throne room, I know, they're not the same. When you walk into that dojo and you see this clip, you know, all those boys and teenagers and that kind of, you know, weird, mean, you know, dojo master are all pretty intimidating. That's their place. A lot of interesting ways of uh, practicing karate take place in there. How is that similar to King David's throne room? Well, I picture in King David's throne room, there's, there's this big throne. There's all these servants, these guards with swords and spears. And Nathan's going to go into that room and tell the king how he's been so wrong and confront him about his sins? Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could do that at all. Like I said, I think I'd be more like Daniel, kind of shaking a little bit, a little bit nervous, but still going in there because Mr. Miyagi's dragging me, right? 
Now, I say this, but from what I'm reading here in 2 Samuel, I don't know why, but I don't picture Daniel-san getting drug in by the Lord into, into King David's throne room. I don't picture Nathan being like Daniel-san. I picture Nathan being more like Mr. Miyagi. Now, when I say that, I'm saying that Nathan is confident, but not in himself, not at all. I picture him being confident because the Lord is sending him, not because someone's dragging him in. So, I think that that's just something that's very amazing to me. Because, yes, the Lord sent him in there, and he feels confident, and he has no hesitation in calling out the greatest king in the world. Well, on the world, I could say, right? So before you go to confront someone about their sin, here's, here's the application of this point. You should seriously spend time in prayer and in the word and seeking out the Lord to be sure that it is your place to go and talk to your fellow brother, talk to your fellow sister about the sin they're struggling with. It shouldn't be about, ha, I'm going to prove them wrong. Ha, I found a fault in them. Ha, I'm going to make myself feel better because they're messing up. If those are our motivations, if those are our reasons for wanting to come alongside someone and help them out, that's not of the Lord. So, after... After that urging from the Lord, after that sending by the Lord, uh, Nathan goes to King David. And instead of coming right to the point, coming right out with a rebuke, Nathan begins to tell a story. Stories are wonderful things. I mean, movies are stories, right? But I, I don't know why. I, I just can't put myself in a story watching a movie. But when I read a book and I, or I actually hear a story being read to me, for some reason, I do a better job of picturing myself in that position, in that place. How many of you kind of feel the same way, that you've ever read a story and you've been so caught up in it, you can't put it down because it feels like you're there? Raise your hand. Where are we at on that? Yeah? Take a few moments. Find an elbow partner. Find someone next to you. And just say what story it was. Explain why you got lost in that story. Take a few moments and do that now. And I know there might be two or three of you like, I've never read a book. <laughs> I get that. As you're talking about this story, I hope one of the things that might, might have been mentioned was why, why that story had that impact on you, and why for many of you sitting here today can go, yes, this was the one, this was the one story. For some of you, like, this was one of 20, right, you know, because we're really big into books, right? I mean, I could probably list at least five or six different stories where I was just lost in it, lost in it because it was just so good. Why is that? Well, I believe because there, that, that a connection's being made, that a connection's being made between you and that story. And I believe that what we're seeing with Nathan, by him telling and weaving this awesome story to King David, is that he's trying to make a connection with the king. So our second point, you need to create a connection with the believer before you confront the sin. Now, when we're talking about creating a connection, I'm not saying that every time you go to someone, you're like, okay, my friend Bill over here is really struggling with this sin. I got to come up with a good story. No, no, no. You don't have to come up with a story every time. But Nathan knows David. They have a relationship. And he knew how to reach David and bring his point across. And he knew that a story was the best way to do that because of that connection. I'm not saying that the Lord might not be pushing you to go to someone you might not have as strong a connection with. I'm not saying that, but what I'm seeing here with Nathan and David is that there's a connection, there's a story, 
And it's almost like Nathan's getting ready to reel David in because he knows David so well. But right now, I'm about to give you a big spoiler alert because we haven't really gone through all of 2 Samuel and in the life of David. But here's the spoiler alert. This is probably not the last time Nathan and David ever talk. You see, even if we go all the way back to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, that one of the verses I talked about a little bit ago, it talks about coming alongside, helping someone down the path with the sin. David should not be told what his sin is and then left alone. Nathan has created a connection. That's part of the relationship, folks. Telling someone where they've messed up, that kind of sucks. Being the person to hear that and then not have anybody to help you out, that's even worse. I don't believe Nathan did that. I believe that Nathan knew because of his relationship with David that David was going to need help. But he also knew that this was the way to connect with David, to get him to realize the truth. So, you find common ground and you make a connection with the person in question. Why? They're going to be more likely to listen. They're going to be more likely to heed your words if it's coming from someone they respect, someone who they know loves them, someone who they know and have a good relationship with. But once you've done that, it's now time to trust the Lord and tell the truth. Once again, I remind you that the prophet Nathan is confronting the most powerful man in the world. Everything that we've read up to this point about King David shows us is that he doesn't lose. Saul, on the other hand, had some victories, but he also had some losses. So far, we've not seen one loss yet with King David. And let's be honest, it's not because it's King David. It's because the Lord's on his side. But if you know that, and you know that David doesn't lose, once again, that's pretty intimidating walking into that throne room and putting your finger on that guy's chest and saying, man, this is where you're screwing up. This is where you are wrong, king. So once again, Nathan's going in there. He's confronting the most powerful man in the world. And then David, who's so enthralled and caught up in that story from Nathan, shouts out the punishment, shouts out what should happen to that rich man who stole the the little baby lamb from the poor man. Now, of course, Nathan, Nathan knew this was coming. The Lord pressed it upon Nathan that this was the best way to connect with, with David, and the Lord prepared Nathan for what he was about to say. You are that man. You are that man is what Nathan said. When Nathan called out David, he didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't try and go around the barn four times before he got to his point. He came right out and said, good, you realize what's going on? So here, I'm going to just put that last little bit in and let him know the truth. You are that man, King David. You are that sinner. That took boldness on the part of Nathan. Why? Well, because this is the king. With just one word from the king, Nathan would be executed. Nathan would be, you know, maybe at best exiled, right? I mean, of course, that didn't happen. But that took boldness on the part of Nathan. But it took more than boldness. And it does go back to verse 1. It took full trust in the Lord. When we go to confront a fellow believer and have that very difficult conversation, because while we might not be wrestling inside our heads about, oh my goodness, is he going to send his armed guards after me? Oh my goodness, am I going to be exiled? No. What we're thinking in the year 2016 is, will they ever speak to me again? Will our relationship ever be the same? How are they going to take this conversation? I mean, those are the things we're really thinking about nowadays, right? We're not worried about the king. 
in his throne room and all his guards and their sharp spears. Whether we're talking about sharp spears or sharp words, we are still called to trust the Lord and do what he's called us to do. And that's tell the truth. So we now come to my favorite part of this chapter, my favorite part. So Nathan has been sent by the Lord to confront King David. He tells a wonderful story. He connects with David, and David responds to that story by, by once again, yelling out what that punishment should be, and Nathan tells him the truth. Nathan tells him the truth and really lets him have it. He tells him exactly what the Lord has told him to say. And then once, once Nathan is done laying that all out for David to hear, once again, this is my favorite spot. David is convicted by the Lord through Nathan's words. He owns his mistakes and he repents. Verse 13, then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's five powerful words, folks. Five very powerful words. I'm a high school teacher. I counted it up this year because I'm not really good at keeping track of time. This is my 12th year of teaching high school students. And that right there almost made me cry. But the one thing that I found out with my high school students, and I can't speak for any of the high school students that are sitting in here today. I can't speak for any of your kids that you've raised or, or you know, kids who are in middle school or whatever. But what I've found with high school students is the one thing they absolutely despise to do is own a mistake. I don't know why. But I found as a coach and as a teacher, <laughs> the biggest punishment I can have them do is stand up and own a mistake. And then you really see who the men and women are. I, I once had a kid, uh, this was probably about 2000, and I'd probably say 12. 2012. We had a really good track team that year. And I had one kid. He was a punk. I'm going to call it like it is. But he was a fast punk. (laughs) Which might be the reason why he was such a... Anyway. We're at the indoor state meet. And he completely disrespects me in front of the whole team. Completely disrespects me in front of the whole team. I just take it in stride. I kind of nod. All right. All right. Next week, we have a track meet. We're back into the outdoor series. He's like, oh, so can I long jump today? I said, nope. He said, why? I'm like, you disrespected me last week. Why should I reward you? He's like, what? Well, what can I do? I said, oh, not a problem. I want an apology. He walked away. It took him four weeks. It took him four weeks. I didn't care. I wasn't going to lose sleep on it. But for some reason, I don't know why, apologizing and owning your own mistakes is so tough nowadays, and I don't get it. Once again, I can't speak for the adults here. I'm just saying these high schoolers, right? At least the ones that I deal with day in and day out. So it's a very interesting thing when I read here in 2 Samuel, David immediately, immediately after being called out by Nathan, says, I've screwed up. I've sinned against the Lord. As I'm preparing for this sermon, I'm like, all right, so, okay, all the times I've been caught out, all the times I've made a mistake, this is what I found, kind of looking back through my own history. Number one, if I am caught making the mistake red-handed, I own it. If I'm brought up about it later, I make excuses, and I'm trying to defend myself. I don't know why, but that's something I've seen about my own heart at times. I'll try and come up with excuses, and I'll try and justify my actions and justify why I'm doing this or why I did that. If I'm caught, oh, you got me. Okay, yeah, (laughs) my bad. This is after the fact. This isn't something that I was dealing with. This This is David, a man after God's own heart. And isn't it interesting that we always use that phrase about David, a man, not a God, not an angel. He's a man, so he's sinful, and we see the sin. But he's a man after God's own heart. So yeah, he's a man, so he's going to sin. You know, that's our nature, right? But then I think one of the things that distinguishes him as a man after God's own heart is his ability to recognize the sin and own it after the confrontation. 
So, as we continue to dive through this, immediately after being called out by Nathan, King David does not come up with excuses. He does not go on the defensive. He just owns it. And then we see Nathan proclaim that the Lord has forgiven David. And this brings us to our fourth point. I don't want to go into all of the details of the next few verses, but if you read verse 14 all the way out through the end, you see what happens to David and Bathsheba. And our fourth point is this. Repentance leads to forgiveness. And that's what we're reading here, right? And and, and this is a big point. How many of you have ever gotten in trouble when you were growing up and you heard this famous phrase uttered by your, perhaps your mother, I did, wait till your father gets home. Scary, 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 scary. This one time, I don't even know what I did. I was just being a tool, it's me, you know. And so I did something wrong and my mom was punishing me with a wooden spoon, you know, didn't take out dad's belt at least not at that point, and, uh, you know, she broke the spoon on me. I laughed. (laughs) Yeah, right? You're with me here, right? (laughs) Oh, Charlotte Rose. Uh, Yes, yes, my love. So, of course, some of you could say that the, the first mistake was, of course, getting in trouble at all, but the biggest mistake was the laugh. Right then and there, my mom's eyes turned a shade of red. I didn't know they were capable of doing it. And she just, she did not scream. She did not yell. She just said, wait till your father gets home, and then walked out of the room. Now, here's the sad part. That happened, I know, before lunch. My dad wasn't getting home till 5.30, 6 o'clock. Longest five to six hours of my life right there, folks. Longest Oh, longest wait of my life. And of course, when you know trouble's coming, when you know the consequence is coming, (laughs) it's going inside your head, you're letting it get worse and worse and worse. And it's almost to the point where, you know, by about, I don't know, 12, 15, I just wish he was home and that I'd already had my beating. Now, I'm not saying that my dad beat me by any means. But of course, I'd just rather get the consequence done and over with because I'm sick and tired of the wait. David has a similar issue to me. Similar, but nowhere near the same. His is, of course, like 10, 20 times as worse. Because if you go to, if you go to Psalm 51, and we're going to take a look at it. If you go to Psalm 51, we read, we read the type of agony that David was going through, just just waiting for the consequence to come down. Now, of course, this psalm was written after his confrontation with Nathan, but it was almost like he was spilling out his heart from the moments after the sinning was taking place with Bathsheba and the lying and the murder and the cheating leading up to the confrontation with Nathan. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Not five or six hours waiting for dad to come home. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit for me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Pause. We've sung those words before, haven't we? It's a worship song we've sung here at Sanctuary. It's not just about taking sin away. I mean, we're seeing David's heart laid out here. 
then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. As we see here, David is not giving lip service. He's not faking it. He's not going through the motions. He's not saying what Nathan and the people of Israel want to hear. He's revealing his broken heart, his repentant heart. And so as we are talking about point number four, repentance leading to forgiveness, once again, that's a point for the person who's accepting and receiving that rebuke, having that confrontation, having their sins laid out to them. It's not easy to give the confrontation. It's not easy to receive it either. So the one last point, once again, as we're reading through the rest of uh, 2 Samuel verse, or chapter 12, the last point to be made is that when you do seek forgiveness through repentance, it doesn't mean that you're going to go unpunished. Forgiveness, point number five, doesn't mean you are free from consequences. sure I say this right. So David and Bathsheba, she's pregnant with a child. David's not going to die. We see that in verse 13 when Nathan says, the Lord's forgiven you. But we still, as we read on, realize and see that the child that Bathsheba is carrying dies. I'm not saying that when we sin, we're going to have our children taken away. But what I am pointing out here is that even though David lived and that he was forgiven by the Lord, the Lord did still see fit to punish him and Bathsheba for their actions and their choices. So, to kind of help illustrate this even more and kind of give you a little bit of real life taste, some of you may know about this story because it happened this past Monday. As parents, Alexis and I have been really doing our best to raise our daughters, you know, not only in a way that, that, that shows love to the Lord, but that also shows respect for themselves and our family and others. Well, uh, in, in doing our best uh, to deal with all of the different situations that comes with raising a three-year-old, uh, we have seen uh, our, our, our oldest, Charlotte, struggle with being respectful of toys and items and other people. Well, every Monday at our house, we host small group. Small group's a wonderful time for our family. I actually cut out from my cross-country practice early so I can be there on time. And uh, it's always a great time to be with fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, studying the Word, praying, and just building great connections. I love it. Easily one of the big highlights of my week. Well, I came home on Monday night. Alexis is in the kitchen. I believe Morgan's in there. A few other people are in there. And Alexis goes says, go look in Evelyn's room. Go see what your daughter has done. Of course, any father that hears that is really excited to walk into that next room. (laughs) So, I go and walk in. In the middle of Evelyn's room are books, toys, jewelry, anything that could be emptied and cleared off a shelf. Even the laundry container, the, like, the dirty clothes hamper was tipped upside down with clothes thrown everywhere. And there was little Charlotte, smiling and laughing, pointing at me in the middle of that mess. Now, I don't know if I could, especially in church, say the first thoughts that went through my head. I, I can't say that I'm nece- necessarily proud of what I was thinking at that moment. It was definitely not the most positive. I will admit that. But I, step, I, I took a step back and I started thinking about what I saw there. And Alexis had a couple of conversations with Charlotte that night. And this is what we found. 
You see, when Charlotte over this past summer would do something similar to this, it was usually in her, cl- in her bedroom. She would throw things off the bed, she'd throw stuff, and sometimes she'd almost hit Evelyn, our one-year-old. And we're talking like throwing clocks, books. And so when we'd catch that happening, of course, we'd have a wonderful conversation. And then we would box up whatever was thrown and put it away for a while. We have a garage, we have an attic, we have shelves way up high. And so Charlotte would lose things. And so as we kind of took a step back and tried to figure out and see what was going on here, we realized something. Charlotte is very clever. And sin is apparent in three-year-olds. In her mind, she was thinking, (laughs) if I do this to Evelyn's stuff, all of Evelyn's stuff's getting taken away, not mine. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah. All right, so, of course, mom and dad packed up all of Evelyn. No, we did not do that. No. That night, small group went back into our sunroom. We prayed, we talked, we did our normal routine. It was Alexis's turn that night, praise the Lord, to be in charge of childcare. And so Alexis made it a point to have Charlotte put every single thing back in Evelyn's room. And then after getting the support and praying and talking with our small group, that night at 8.30, our small group marched right into Charlotte's bedroom and we emptied it of everything but a bed and empty bookshelves. Like, even the nightstand was left, but I took the drawer out. I mean, there's stuff in there. And so her room is the most empty it's been since we've moved into that house. But I would be remiss to say if it just stopped right there, because it did not. Just taking things out of Charlotte's room does not mean that a lesson's going to be learned. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to correct, or correct this action and, and stop it from happening in the future. So, of course, Alexis and I, we sat down and had a good conversation with Charlotte. She knows that we love her. She knows that we forgive her. But she is also learning that just because mommy and daddy love and forgive you doesn't mean that you're, not going, to, that you're going to get away scot-free. It doesn't mean that you're going to get away without any form of a consequence. That's just the way our Father up in heaven works. Sometimes he gives us consequences, even though he loves and forgives us, but it's for our own good. If you continue through 2 Samuel, you know what happened to David and Bathsheba? They had another kid. He was pretty good. You know, he had a lot of potential. His name was Solomon. So, like David... You know, my daughter Charlotte, you know, she's forgiven. But like David, she still received that consequence. So why is this important? Why am I making such a big deal about this? A true and repentant heart does not ask forgiveness, does not seek for forgiveness just to get out of a punishment. If that's why you are owning a mistake, just to get something you want, Is that true repentance? Is that what the Lord's seeking after? The only punishment I can ever say and assure you that you will always be assured of getting out of when you have a relationship with the Lord is hell. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you admit that he died on that cross for you, if you admit that you're a sinner, because I've seen sin start as young as three years old, and I'm pretty confident that since you were three years old, you've at least sinned at least once. But if you can admit and own that stuff and accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, there's one punishment you can't escape. But once again, are we doing it just to escape punishment or are we doing it because we truly love the Lord? So to close this up, confronting a fellow brother and sister or sister in Christ, it's not always an easy thing to do. You know, we sometimes worry about things. So we sometimes become like Daniel. But when we seek out the Lord, 
when we make sure that we have a connection with, with a fellow brother or fellow, fellow sister who's kind of gone down a wrong path? When you tell them the truth, because you're led to by the Lord to tell them that, that truth, you can be sure that God's going to do a good work in that situation, that he's going to have your back. It might not always happen right away. Just because David repented like that doesn't mean that the person you talk to is just going to turn it all over right there and just, oh, I'm perfect now, I'm great now. It it can be a process. That's why in Galatians we're encouraged to come alongside because it's going to be a process. But just know that the Spirit is at work, especially if we're obedient to the Lord. Let's pray. Daddy, uh, when it comes to sin, you've laid the foundation for how we should act and how we should react. You forgive us, uh, not just for those little sins in life, but also for those, for those life-dominating sins that we struggle with as well. You love us all in that way. Lord, you love the person who's been a believer since the age of 12, but you also love that the person who accepted Jesus just this last week at the refuge just as much. And we thank you for that, Lord. Help us, Father, to remember that when we have these difficult conversations with fellow brothers and sisters and when we confront them about their sin. Lord, I right now want to pray for the individual who might be sitting here who does not know you. They don't have a relationship with you, Lord. They they, they have this tug at their heart, but they're not sure what to do. Well, I ask you, Father, I ask you, Father, to give them boldness like you gave Nathan. Boldness to when we start singing in a little bit, to stand up and walk over to this prayer room where I know that Brad and Shelly, and if need be, others are just hoping and chomping at the bit to be able to pray with them and help them know what it means to have a personal relationship with you. Ultimately, Lord, this story about David is about grace, it's about forgiveness, and we thank you for that grace and forgiveness that you always extend to us each and every day. And it is in Jesus' mighty name that we pray, amen.